Okay, I'm going to talk about uh, chapter 38, which is the human-animal bond and euthanasia. This is a really difficult um, topic, and we're going to talk about this a couple of times. Um, it's important to understand it, uh, and it's important to understand why uh, we have the bond we do with certain animals and how to help, um, as veterinary professionals, how to help um, others with going through the loss of an animal. We're also going to be talking a little bit about um, how to help yourself as you have to deal with uh, euthanizing animals. And we're also going to talk about large animals as well. So there is an increasing importance of pets. Uh, this happens with urbanization, people moving into the cities, um, changing of family and social structures. We're seeing more single parent homes, single adults and couples opting to remain childless, but getting pets uh, as a way to um, and complete their families. There's also a new utilitarian role for pets, so assisting disabled, socialization for socially challenged, animal-assisted therapy programs, and depression prevention in elderly and homebound. So a lot of um, interweaving of uh, pets within our society uh, that we haven't had in the past. So pet loss is a significant event, and obviously in veterinary me medicine we are um, the ones that are are tasked with uh, dealing with it. Um, it can be intensified by being the sole mourner. So if you're the only one that is losing the pet, it can make it much stronger um, uh, experience for you. Um, there may be support systems that are lacking. Uh, outsiders do not always acknowledge or understand the full extent of pet attachment. Um, it's, you know, it's difficult. It's not always, everybody's lost a human um, uh, person in some way, typically, uh, but not everybody is as attached to pets as, as uh, you may be with your pet. Uh, veterinary professionals are often seen as a source of support and understanding, and uh, they may be the only ones uh, that are there. So um, you do have to have some grief counseling skills. It's becoming really important. Grief is this, uh, sorry, it's defined as mental anguish after loss of an object um, of attachment. So this object of attachment that we're talking about at this point uh, is pets, but it could be death, divorce, job loss, or moving. Um, it's a process of letting go, reinvesting um, uh, emotional growth and new attachments. And if you have a number of these things going on at one time, it can really intensify the grief. So pet loss, um, there are stages of grief. Uh, these stages are not in uh, a specific order. They do usually end with resolution, but they can circle back uh, to other things um, uh, at any point during the stage uh, during the grief process. So denial, bargaining, anger, or guilt. Guilt is anger toward Edward. When I heard that, I was I was um, kind of surprised that it actually it makes sense and then depression and resolution denial is a normal defense mechanism uh, you'll see a lot of people in denial about um, their own behavior or uh, about the behavior of others uh, people in denial about what's actually happening in front of their eyes you can see denial in a client's eyes and demeanor um, Denial is very normal, and it's uh, it's something that will some people move past very quickly, and some people um, it takes them a little bit longer. Bargaining um, is when the client may maneuver personally and privately, negotiate with God, negotiate with you, negotiate with a veterinarian, negotiate with their family members. They're looking for that miracle. Stages of grief um, continued. Uh, we have uh, anger. Um, anger is a tough one for us to do. Um, uh, really, it, it will, anger will be directed at you, but anger really comes from within somebody else. So it's really important not to take that on. Clients will move into and out of this emotion and it'll have to be exhibited in a variety of direct and indirect ways, and it can manifest in the form of guilt. Depression is also called grief. Um, sometimes there's, they're used uh, interchangeably. Uh, depression can is a very serious condition. Um, 
uh, medical condition can lead to irritability, sleep irregularity, restlessness, inability to concentrate. And if the depression is severe, uh, we may need to refer people to a counselor. You are not a counselor. And when you see depression in somebody, it may be important for them to um, find somebody to talk to. Um, moving beyond depression, we get to acceptance, a part of resolution. Um, it it's, it's your job to acknowledge grief and acknowledge the stages that clients are going through and to do what you can to uh, help them to move through those stages um, in their own way and at their own pace. Not everyone's going to move through it within three days. Uh, it is something that can take um, a period of years or, or you know weeks, months, years. Um, usually we see resolution as the client gets that can be denial as well. So we need to watch for those things. Um, we want to make sure that we are um, helping where we can and then referring where we can't. So we do have to do euthanasia in our business. Um, it is not always an easy thing to do. Um, it can be made easier um, by uh, putting policies and protocols in place that protect not only the client, but the patient and you yourself. Um, so the decision comes um, about usually because the animal is suffering in some way. But you do need to get a lot of information. Um, you need to get information about the, you know, when we're making that decision um, or the client is making that decision. And you need to provide information for the client so that they can make the right decision. You want to make sure that you're not making the decision for the client. You're not telling the client, oh, it's not time yet or, oh, now's the time. Um, you can say you can say things like, "Well, we have um, we have a, you know a number of uh, conditions going on here. They're incompatible with life. Uh, this animal is not doing well and is not feeling well. It seems to be in a lot of pain. Um, but it, and it's really hard to say. Oh, it's time. It, it's hard not to say it's time or oh, I don't think it's time yet. That's really their decision." One thing you do want to be careful is that the client is not making a decision based on convenience so much. Now, convenience doesn't necessarily mean that they are unable to pay for something. That is not necessarily a convenience factor. If they're able to pay for something and choose not to, that's more of a convenience factor. But sometimes we have to make, we have to allow them to make that decision whether, you know, it's, if it's something that's going to take a lot of money and we're not going to have a lot of time with that um, patient anyway, um, you need to allow them to make that that decision um, based on uh, on what's right for them and their family at that time. And that's not necessarily a convenience thing, but that's where ethics and concerns really uh, come into play. Um, and we just have to kind of talk through that. Providing information is the best thing that you can do. Um, preparing for euthanasia. Don't use any other terms. Use the term euthanasia. When you use the term putting to sleep, and for instance, you might have a child in the room, that child may never want to go to sleep again. So you want to really be, be sure that you're using the right term. Um, the client's decisions uh, are important to the client. It's also important to the pet. So we need to help them decide who's going to be present. If they can be present, some people are not emotionally prepared to be present when their pet is put down, uh, is, is uh, uh, given the euthanasia solution. If they're not able to be, you have to be able to respect that. Um, but you can tell them, I will be present. I will be there for you. And that's okay too. Um, Scheduling, we want to schedule a euthanasia so it's at a quiet time uh, in the hospital. We don't want a lot of activity. We want to allow for that grieving process. We need to understand that there's going to be pain, there's going to be fear, there's going to be distress, um, and we want to alleviate that as much as possible in the pet as well as the client. Our location should be a quiet location um, away from the normal traffic of the area. We want to make sure that uh, the people have time and room to grieve. We want to expect and plan for the unexpected. Um, we want to try to minimize distress in the uh, patient and the client as much as possible. Um, we want to maybe have a, a quiet room, a comfortable place um, for the, the pet to be pet put down. We also want to make sure that we have the pet maybe sedated um, with appropriate sedation. Um, 
uh, in some cases, having the pet anesthetized prior to euthanasia is appropriate as well. When we um, we want to have a, a you know a soft blanket or a towel under them, they may defecate, they may urinate. We need to warn the the client about that. We also need to warn them that uh, they may go through an excitement phase as well. So what I usually tell people is. Um, I'm happy to have you present. The, the pet does know that you're here. Uh, I think it's important for the pet uh, for you to be here. This is what you need to know about when I give this overdose of anesthetic. It is an overdose of anesthetic. So the first thing that's going to happen is they're going to lose consciousness and all pain will go away. Anything that happens after that, they are not aware of. So occasionally, if we have a decrease in the, the heart rate or the cardiac output, blood flow through the body, or some weird nervous system things happening, we may see some paddling of the limbs. We They may vocalize a little bit. That's why we try to give some sedatives ahead of time so that doesn't happen. But they may vocalize, they may paddle, they may lose control of their bladder or, or defecate. We need to be aware that that's happening, but they're not aware of what's going on. I also want to let them know that the next thing that will happen is their breathing will stop and then their heart will stop. And I will let them know when their heart has stopped. And at that point, we will we'll, um, say that they're, they've uh, passed on. They will uh, not close their eyes when we euthanize them. Um, so you can you can cover that however you like, but I like to say, you know, they like to see uh, where they're going. They like to see, you know, they, they're they aware of, you know, till the very end. And once I give them the euthanasia solution, they're no longer aware. So whatever you need to say to make the owner uh, uh, comfortable with the fact that their eyes will remain open. They won't close their eyes as if they're sleeping. That's why we call it euthanasia. Um, we will give this uh, in the vein as much as possible. In some cases, the veins are not... We're not able to get into the vein. We may have to give directly into the heart. Um, those are uh, instances where I typically won't have an owner present. I will euthanize the pet and then bring them to the um, to the client. Um, but uh, that, that's typically where we'll do it. If we have a small animal, a small mammal, like a hamster or a gerbil, we can give it in the peritoneal cavity, which is the abdominal cavity, and there's a specific way to do that as well. Um, before we euthanize, we should have some ideas of what we're going to do with a pet um, the deceased, the, the remains of the pet afterwards. Uh, we, want, we do want to pronounce the patient dead because that um, indicates body. They may not want to. If they do want to view the body, we make sure that the, the body is cleaned up. Um, we want to make sure we have signs of sympathy. Um, we, we will sign cards and send it to them. Uh, we will make sure we have some of these arrangements um, as far as are we cremating the animal? Are you taking the body home with you? Um, what are some arrangements you want to do? Uh, and then we, you may have some special things in your clinic that you do for these special pets. Uh, you may do a impression of the nose, a nose print, or an impression of the paws um, so that they will have some sort of remembrance uh, for their um pet. Sometimes I will ask ahead of time, would you like to keep the collar? Would you like some hair of your pet um, so that we can uh, provide what they need in order to grieve? Um, whether this is a smooth euthanasia or a difficult euthanasia, there's going to be some stress. So you need to be sure of yourself. Um, talk about what your limits are um, and what your thoughts are with the process. Uh, it's important to get this out. It's important to talk about it. In a shelter or research facility, there are very specific laws um, because there are um, more euthanasias occurring and this is a very stressful environment for people um, having to go through this. It's really not stressful for animals because of the way that we are required to do it. Um, so we want to try to um, uh, make sure that the people who are doing it are um, not stressed as well. So we have a designated euthanasia room. Um, no live animals are, are permitted in that room. Uh, one a euthanasia is occurring. And we're going to remove a euthanasia animal, euthanized animal before we bring another one in. So we don't have any dead animals in there uh, when another animal is coming in. 
Um, it's important that we rationalize, so we were able to rationalize why we're doing this. In some cases, it's because the animal is sick, and in some shelters, it's because there's not enough room for healthy animals um, or unhealthy animals in the in the um, uh, in the facility. Um, uh, rotating responsibilities is, is important as well. So not being the person who has to make those choices or euthanize the animals every single day is important. With large animals, um, it's a safety issue. When they go down, they go down very quickly and they can take you with them. Uh, typically we'll inject into the jugular vein uh, because we can get um, substances, these, this, it's thick substance, so we want to get it in as quickly as possible. Um, we will want to place a, an IV catheter. in. Anytime we do a euthanasia, honestly, an IV catheter is the best way to do it. Uh, cephalic vein is a dangerous second site, but it is possible to place a catheter in the cephalic vein and do it that way. Uh, we administer the euthanasia uh, solution extremely quickly and a, a large overdose. We want to drop them as quickly as possible um, because if they go through an excitement period, um, it, that can be really dangerous. The vocalization and the, and the um, paddling can be dangerous to those. Um, we want to be very careful where we're, we are euthanizing them as well because we have to be able to move them from that area to a different place. If you have any questions, we will discuss this further. Um, it's a difficult topic, topic, and we should be discussing it uh, frequently. Um, honestly, it's you may think it's one of the worst things that you ever have to do, um, but I'll be very honest with you: it is. It is not uh, euthanasia done correctly and done at the right time um, and done with um, compassion is sometimes one of the most beautiful things that you can be a part of.